Um, well, shifting gears, we're going to go to um, some information on inspections and, and future populations. So we'll welcome uh, Chris Logue with um, New York State Department of Ag and Markets and uh, Dana Rhodes from the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture. There's Chris. Chris is on. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for having us this morning. And uh, there's Dana. So I think we're we're going to do a little little bit of a tag team kind of a thing here. I've got some slides I'm going to share, and I think Dana is going to uh, make some comments as we go along. And so uh, now I'll see uh, how I do with sharing. And so far, not too good. Hang on for just a second. Can you guys see my slides now? They're up. Beautiful. Thank you. I always have to. Uh, I have to relearn. We have so many platforms. So uh, thanks everybody for your patience and and thank you for the two prior presentations, which which uh, you're you're both tough acts to follow here. And uh, really, I think in uh, both both presenters had some really good advice. I think the advice that uh, Dr. Helmus gave as far as uh, uh, where we are at the at the tail end of his presentation is is really, really uh, valuable, good advice for everybody. Um, it's interesting to see those models as they develop. And um, it's great that everybody's able to learn from those that that go before them. So Dana and I were asked to talk a little bit about uh, inspection and interceptions and and future populations. And I, I put these slides together. There's a there's some retread slides in here that maybe people have seen before, um, but I think they're they're worth repeating. And uh, this is kind of uh, my take on on uh, where we are, what we've seen. Um, and I think you know the major thing that I'd like to kind of start out with is is just to say um that uh um there we go that uh, slf is a very challenging um you know pest for us to um for us to deal with and we always want to have uh, a situation uh where we're uh, looking at the correct pathways to regulate detect and manage and uh uh, be, have our eyes open as as we're going along through this. I think it's really important to point out, and probably if you've reviewed your uh, your presentation materials that were on the uh, invite for this meeting, you've you've learned that it can move uh, in multiple life stages. Uh, eggs, obviously, by via short and long distance, and adults via many pathways, both uh, short distance and long distance. And so when you have a lot of uh, pathways and a lot of different ways that the pest can move, uh, there's a lot of different places that you're gonna have to be looking for it. So some of the things that we, you know, places where we'd expect to see spotted lanternfly, uh, and we've pulled, I've pulled these out of, uh, out of our exterior quarantine regulation. Uh, and these are sort of the, the typical things that we regulate uh, when you're when you're a state plant regulatory official, landscape remodeling, uh, construction materials and waste, all types of plants and plant parts, um, packing materials, which sometimes you know some of us regulate, some of us don't, and then the outdoor household articles, similar to what we might do in um, uh, Gypsy Moth and and some other programs. So those are the places where we, you know, we where we expect to see uh, spotted lantern fly. These are places that typically we are, um, you know, comfortable working with. And so one of the things that's been uh, really interesting as we've gone along is to look at some of the really unexpected places where we've actually found spotted lantern fly. And so uh, going back to 2016. Our uh, first find of spotted lanternfly in New York, which was a which was a find of some dead insects, 
um, was actually in a shipment of, of pharmaceutical containers. And so the pharmaceutical containers uh, were manufactured uh, in, in Pennsylvania. The uh, bottler uh, or the company that put, puts the pills in the bottle uh, was in uh, New York State. And um, what we found is uh, we got called in uh, from a shipping type person in this business, and they had actually found some dead spotted lanternfly, not physically in the actual pharmaceutical containers, but in the shrink wrap on a uh, particular pallet. And so that's a pathway that, uh, you know, I didn't know we had a, uh, I didn't know that we had a pharmacy that was, or a, or a company that was uh, engaged in, in making those products in that particular county. Uh, I venture to guess that Dana didn't know she had a company in Pennsylvania that made pharmaceutical containers. And so kind of uh, that's where the matchmaking on all this spotted lanternfly stuff started. Um, the other one that we saw a number of times uh, uh, early on, and again, these were, these were uh, dead insects, was in uh, bakery and confectionery ingredients that were going back and forth uh, between uh, the two states. And again, not actually in the ingredients, but in the packaging materials. And so as time went on, what we learned was that um, how those materials are handled on the loading dock and how they're handled on the uh, back of the truck is really, really important because at certain times of the year, the adult lanternfly are going to try to migrate into that packing material to, to stay warm. And um, so you have to be very, very aware of that. The other one that we found out about uh, along the way uh, was paint shipments. And so uh, Pennsylvania has a, apparently a thriving paint industry um, and, uh, and we must use a lot of paint, especially in the Rochester area because early on we found uh, a number of reports out of some of the chain stores uh, up in the Rochester, New York area uh, that they were finding spotted lanternfly um, in some of the packing materials on um, the paint shipments. And so, um, you know, one of the things that I noticed on one of uh, the models that was shown in the previous presentation is that the Interstate 81 corridor uh, lit up up through New York. And I think I also saw in the chat earlier a little bit about Interstate 81 and, and um, that's definitely been a concern of ours all along here, but Rochester is basically at the northern end of Interstate 81. And so, but interestingly enough, as we've, as we've surveyed in the Rochester area, and we had quite a few finds of, of dead insects, I don't think we found a population up in that Rochester area as of, as of yet. So, um, the other thing that I'd point out here, uh, all kinds of building materials, uh, definitely things that you should be you should be looking at as well. And Chris, I just want to add to that. On it is very interesting because um, when the adults are out, especially September, October, when we're getting those chilly mornings, um, and the sun starts beating on these packaged products, they will insert themselves into um, between the plastic and the boxes uh, that have been shrink wrapped to the point where they actually kill themselves. Uh, so they are seeking that heat. It's very important to them. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So the other thing that I just wanted to talk a little bit about, and this isn't necessarily New York centric uh, as far as finding spotted lanternfly or intercepting it in all of these types of conveyances. This is more of an aggregation of, of what we've seen around the Northeast. But obviously, you know, um, commercial trucks are uh, really very, very important uh, uh, conveyance to be aware of. Uh, there's a lot of uh, talk, and if you and if you engage with us in the Spotted Lanternfly Summit, probably we'll hear a little bit more about rail and rail equipment. Um, we had uh, an interception here in uh, New York several years ago. I think it was the first one that was related to a, to a coastwise uh, ship, actually, that was, was in the port of uh, Red Hook, which is in uh, 
uh, the New York City area. Um, and uh, that was the first time that we had seen it on a on a ship or a barge. That uh, ship was heading heading south, and uh, USDA uh, was able to do some treatments on that and and mitigate that issue. But again, you have to look at that. So if you have maritime commerce or or uh, river commerce of any kind, um, you have to be looking at that. And then, of course, aircraft, which there's been some really good research recently on. So I, I skipped over personal vehicles and RVs because I wanted to kind of um, uh, delve into that a little bit more and just kind of give you a little bit of sort of anecdotal information that we're finding out of our surveys here over the past year or so. And I think this is something that, that uh, we all can learn from uh, and think about a little bit. Early on, obviously, if you read our exterior quarantine, we were very, very concerned about commercial traffic, trucks, uh, rail equipment, all those things that I've mentioned. And we were um, maybe a little bit less focused on personal vehicles, recreational vehicles, and that type of thing. But what we're finding in some of our survey in New York here over the past year or so, or two years, I would say, is that we're finding this uh, spotted lanternfly in places um, where there's a lot of sort of local recreational activity. So for instance, um, we, have a, we have a place in the location in the lower Hudson Valley um, that's a popular uh, rail trail where people uh, come uh, north out of the city uh, or off of Long Island uh, to go hiking. And that's a location where we've found a pretty significant population. Um, the other location where we where we found it um, that's a little bit further up the Hudson uh, the Hudson River Valley is at the uh, walkway over the Hudson, which is an old railway bridge that's been repurposed as a uh, basically like a scenic overlook where people can uh, walk across the bridge, uh, take photos and such, and get from one side of the river to the other. And we do think um, that you know being locked down for COVID. Uh, a lot of these local recreational areas have gotten a lot more traffic. And so I think there's maybe a correlation there. Uh, and again, but very much an anecdotal type of a thing, but that's an observation that, that we certainly have seen here uh, in New York State. And Chris, going along with that, in Pennsylvania, we did recognize that and we have a checklist for our residents. So when um, they are moving around in the quarantine area or out of, they have a homeowner's checklist that they can go through for their RV, for their personal vehicles. Um, and we require that of all of our employees that they have to inspect their vehicles uh, before they start moving around again, because we do recognize that as a way that they will travel with you. Um, so, you know, something, again, this is an outreach moment. You've got to educate people on what to look for and what to do when they find it. Good point. Thank you, Dana. So I wanted to transition a little bit to, to talk a little bit about what an interception means for you. And, and I'm coming at this kind of uh, from the standpoint of, of how I was thinking about this early on uh, in the program. And, and frankly, before we had spotted lanternfly. And so obviously um, New York and Pennsylvania, we share a big border. We also share a border uh, with New Jersey. Um, and also we do a lot of commerce obviously with both Pennsylvania, New Jersey uh, and, and several of the other East Coast states. And so when this was found in 2014 in Pennsylvania, um, I really anticipated that, that we would locate it and uh, find a population in New York State um, fairly early on, I was thinking 2015, 2016. Um, and despite a lot of survey efforts and a lot of outreach efforts, um, we, did not, we did not find a population in New York until um, the late summer of uh, 2020, I believe, and then uh, had a number of fines that came very, very quickly on that. So thinking back uh, on, on where we were in 2014, 15, 16, and through the, those times, what we were looking at is, is you have an interception of spotted lanternfly, whether it's a dead insect or a, li or a living insect, 
it's giving you a little bit of an indication about what the pathways are. And so, as I said early on, we had that one in, in 2016 uh, with pharmaceuticals. That was a little bit of a, or pharmaceutical containers, I should say. That was a really a wake up call. Okay, here's a pathway that we really never had thought about. Um, and uh, certainly one that we weren't familiar with having any sort of regulatory authority or action with. Um, you know, I, I think when you're finding dead spotted lanternfly, it really would behoove you to be uh, thinking about um, did others make the same trip and uh, survive and escape? Did others make the trip previously and not get observed or found? Um, Obviously, you need to be asking how many of them need to survive the trip to establish. And I know what we found uh, early on is the adults seem to, they don't travel well, <laughs> typically, they can, they get kind of uh, weakened. And so we've observed some uh, that have been collected that are, that are really uh, pretty sluggish. Also depends a little bit, I think, upon the time of year when you're finding them, where you're finding them. But basically, you know, one of the challenges that we've really had is, is that, you know, we have these finds, and I use again Rochester as an example. Um, you know, Rochester was a place where we had a number of, of finds of, um, of dead insects over the years. We've surveyed it a fair amount. And, you know, we haven't, haven't come up with a population at this point. You know, other places uh, where we uh, expected it uh, to be um, or didn't expect it to be, uh, we found it found it much earlier. So very, very unpredictable. Um, but but certainly, I think there are some lessons that you all can learn from us here. So just a little bit as far as receiving goods from quarantined areas, you know, you should be, I think if you didn't don't have spotted lantern fly in your state, you want to be working with, with your uh, industries to tell them what they should be looking for, describe what it looks like, uh, describe the whole thing that, that Dana and I both have talked about with them getting into the packing materials so that people are aware and that they're looking at it. And this relates back to what Dr. Helmus uh, said, which is that if you, I do think if you find this early and you're sort of in an isolated area, I think your story can perhaps be different than the story on the East Coast. And I think that's a, a really um, good, good point to keep in mind. Um, the other thing that I wanted to just make a comment about is, is that if you do find something uh, in, a, in a shipment, uh, I know that uh, I wanna know about it if it's from New York and I, and I know uh, that Dana wants to know about, if it, about it if it's from New Jersey or uh, from Pennsylvania. And I know, uh, you know, my other colleagues here in the Eastern Plant Board who've got this going on in their states wanna know about it as well. And so, you know, good communication is really, really key. If you find that there's a pathway, uh, let us know so that we can uh, work with it in our state and uh, try to solve the issue for you. I'm giving you a little break to jump in if you need to. You know me, I'm not bashful. Okay. <laughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about some things that we did early on, and these may be repeats for folks. Um, this is a little bit about what we did with regulatory work back earlier on. And again, uh, focusing in on uh, targeted geographic areas, we were looking at inter the Interstate 81 corridor, the Interstate 84 corridor. Um, we did avoid the Interstate 95 corridor coming into the New York City area just because of safety uh, reasons, and uh, we didn't we didn't want to have a uh, moment where uh, we shut down a bridge from New Jersey and and run into any uh, major problems. So um, we did a couple of uh, or, or various. Um, you know, uh, truck stops. We've been doing these types of things actually prior to Spotted Lanternfly. We've got a really great relationship with our um, New York State Department of Transportation truck inspection unit, as well as the state police. So we don't go out and do this on our own. What we do is we, we uh, tag along uh, to a safety inspection type of a situation. And so, um, you know, the trucks will be pulled into the way station. They'll go through all of the safety stuff with the DOT folks. 
Um, and then uh, we do a little bit of a pre-screening about uh, uh, where they're coming from. And um, then if they're coming from an area known to have spotted lanternfly, we'll, we'll pull them over uh, aside and we'll uh, talk a little bit more, take a look at the truck, see, see what we find. Uh, the ones coming from areas not known to have spotted lanternfly, we do some outreach on them so that they understand what it is and what they're looking for um, and, and try to get folks uh, aware of the potential of moving this. Um, just a little bit uh, of information on what we found in 2018 versus 2019. Obviously, uh, compliance really, really changed over, uh, over the two years. And um, you know that really was due to a lot of outreach happening between both Pennsylvania and New York. And you know the the results that we got uh, with our checkpoint work actually, I think, helped with some funding uh, for Pennsylvania to do some similar work. And of course, in 2020, uh, we had the pandemic uh, start and um, had a lot of plans for doing this type of work in 2020 and 2021. And we did not uh, follow through on it because of uh, safety concerns with having our inspectors uh, out doing the work, as well as um, the uh, perception that perhaps we were, uh, that our inspection work would have an impact on, uh, negative impact on the supply chain issues that we, we were seeing. And just a couple of innovative things that we did here. Um, we did actually partner with our Department of Environmental Conservation and we used a, a UAV uh, with, a, with a camera so that we could get uh, above the various vehicles that we were inspecting and take a close look at what we found on the, on the roofs. Also, um, Go to the next one here. Obviously, truckload of stone, really very, very difficult thing for us to inspect. Uh, use the UA, UAVs there um, and uh, with some level of, of success. And then finally, um, we actually, we have, a, uh, we have a group here in New York, um, the uh, Hudson, uh, Lower Hudson Valley PRISM Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. They're funded out of our Department of Environmental Conservation and they have a spotted lanternfly detector dog. And we did use and continue to uh, engage with that group and, and use their detector dog. We used it several times on these, these truck stops. Um, there's a close up photo that I don't have in the slide set of the dog finding a uh, spotted lanternfly in the grill of the truck, which is where you would expect to find it. Um, but it was a situation where um, it had been overlooked uh, in the process of the of the visual inspection and the dog picked it up because it was shoved into the uh, into the louvers in, in the radiator on the truck. So I think uh, just going ahead here, uh, this is the last slide that I have. I think, again, really very, very important for you to be thinking a little bit outside the box. Uh, some other things that I would uh, encourage you to think about, um, understand what your authorities are, which industries are you able to work with? Um, do you have the authority to do this type of a truck inspection? Do you have the authority to go to the chain store? Mm -hmm and not only look at the plants, but also look at the uh, paint and see if there are spotted lanternfly in there. How, how do you respond to that? So authority, the authority to do these things is, is one aspect of it. And then the second aspect of it is, is do you have the resources to do these things? Because these are very, very resource intensive things. Um, and I think, you know, going forward, we need to do some prioritization here in, in New York. And, and again, I want to be clear, I'm speaking now strictly for myself, not for my, for my great neighbor to the South. We really need to do some prioritization as far as where we put our resources. Um, does it make sense to continue to do this type of a, of a roadside check uh, for compliance purposes? I, I think it served a purpose early on. Um, Obviously, we're very focused in New York as a big uh, grape state. We have a lot of juice grape production. We also have, have a lot of wine grape production that there's been 
significant public investment into both of those industries over the past 10 years. So we have a lot to protect and a lot to lose there. And so um, as we get deeper into this, that becomes you know, more of our priority going forward. So Dana, with that, uh, I think those are my comments, both from my slides and from my notes, and maybe you want to fill in some more blanks there. Sure. Um, if you can stop sharing, I also have some slides to share. Beautiful. There you go. It's all yours. Thank you, sir. So, Chris, are they seeing the You slide? got it. Yep, we see them. Okay. So Can you put it in presenter mode. Oh, there you go. There Thank you. you. Go. Yep. So um, Chris made some really good points and I'm going to stress some of the same, but I'm also going to point out some other things. Uh, regulatory authorities, we, we tend to think um, it has to be just us. And with this particular insect, that's not the truth. Um, you, you've got to expand. You've got to include partnerships. Um, early on, Pennsylvania uh, worked, reached out to Penn State and USDA, and we formed um, a uh, unified command so that we could really put forth a, a greater effort. Um, and putting that effort um, gave us a better, better understanding of the roles of each of us and what we needed to do and helped with our communications process. And as Chris and I have both mentioned that outreach is, is critical. Um, and working with, with your universities. Uh, you've heard too of um, our, our, our great uh, workers on this, Matt and Julie, and I, I cannot tell you how much or how grateful I am that they are here um, in Pennsylvania and working on this because we use their information constantly as we're, we're going through um, our processes. Um, and you can see a lot of people um, working on these partnerships. And, you know, Matt's work has helped us when we are looking at our survey. Um, and each year we go through, and this map is showing um, positives and negatives. Uh, we do look throughout the state and having additional forces with our uni uh, university teams that are out in the field, they get back with us. Uh, we have all of our employees looking for this as well. And we've had several moments where we've said, there's been an interception. We have seen a positive report. And one of those that I find very interesting is Center County. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, this is where Penn State University sits. So we know that there are, are great moments when there are great crowds coming in from all over the US to visit this campus. And the red dots here indicate where we have had reports and we followed up and we found one. We found a single adult, maybe two adults, but for, for all the survey that we have done, we have not been able to find a population. And this happens each year. Um, so be prepared that you're not going to find it the first year. You may not find it the second year, but be aware that you need to continue to go back to these areas because there may be something brewing. Um, we just don't know. We're don't have that lure. Um, I know that they're working on it, but we don't have that tool yet uh, that can help us get through that moment. Um, so, and it's also dependent on the time of day that you're there. If you're there early in the morning or late in the evening, they're not as active. You may not see them. You need a nice sunny day um, because if there's several of them, you're gonna see that honeydew secretion that's coming from them. Um, you're gonna see them moving around um, and if a cloud passes through the sun, you will notice immediately how quickly they slow down. So when you have these moments, please follow up um, on these interceptions coming in. Another interesting thing that I found in, in Pennsylvania is Dauphin County. In 2018, um, and the, the yellow star is Harrisburg. And in 2017, we found um, fairly established populations. Uh, we have a major rail hub there. We have some trucking companies in there. And we found spotted lanternfly there. 
I live in Upper Dauphin, where that blue um, indicator is right here. I did not see my first spotted lanternfly until this fall. So it's not like every county is inundated with spotted lanternflies. So when we call a county, you will see there are major areas that have all these green dots, those are all negative. So there, we can't find spotted lanternfly there. So yes, pathways, I agree with Matt, that is probably the way this will spread more often. There is going to be some natural spread, but don't think that you call a county one year and then the entire county is inundated. That is why our quarantine, it's important for us to continue to ask people to check their vehicles. Um, you know, we know that there's some collapse going on in the original uh, locations in Berks County. We don't want to repop, we don't want to be the way to repopulate an area. Um, other things that we have been doing actively, uh, working with uh, Norfolk Southern, we have treated several of their major railroads, our rail yards in Pennsylvania, and we'll, we're signed up to do even more next year. So we're, you know, we're working with them. Um, Pennsylvania has 64 different um, rail lines in Pennsylvania. So we, we try and work with them. It is um, a challenge, but don't give up. As we learn more, we have to change our mode of operation, which Pennsylvania has. We're now dividing our state into three uh, sections. We have an Eastern, Central and Western zone. Um, as you can see with three different colors there uh, that and each will have their own distinct office, um, but all of us maintaining and doing the same things in each of those offices as we move forward. Uh, companies, the permit system, again, outreach is important. Raise the awareness of employees um, and knowing what to look for, when to look. Um, over 28,000 companies, and that is nationwide. And we have several provinces in Canada that also have gone through our permit system. We need to make sure that anybody who comes into the areas know what they're coming into so that they are not the way that this moves out. Like Chris, we have different activities that we do uh, for compliance and enforcement. We actually started this year where we will send a notice to a county saying we're going to be there at a certain uh, for a certain week um, and go in our compliance and enforcement team goes in and talks to those businesses, gets them permit information if they're not permitted, checks records. Um, we find that this works very well. Uh, we're able to hit a lot of relatively high number of businesses as we do that. Uh, we also too use roadside inspections like uh, New York and yes, um, 2020 COVID uh, really knocked us back, but we appreciate our partnerships with the state police as we move forward on that. When a state contacts me to let me know that they have received material that came from Pennsylvania, uh, we do follow up on that. We do take that seriously. Uh, we want to figure out how it happened. If they're not permitted, we talk to them, um, let them know what the importance is uh, to make sure, again, that their employees are inspecting and making sure they are not the reason um, that they are spreading spotted lantern fly. For compliance and enforcement, we also have a canine detector. This is Lucky. She was trained by UPenn. Uh, we're very proud of her. She's done uh, quite an extensive uh, amount of work, not just looking um, at the roadside inspections. We also use her for nursery inspection. Uh, we have a company that ships tens of thousands of nursery stock trees into Canada. Uh, so she went through and looked at those. Uh, we're happy to say after we had worked with the company, they did a spectacular job. We did not find any egg masses on any of those trees uh, that were shipped out. Um, she does is able to get into uh, truck areas that we cannot. And she also found a mother load of egg masses, which I'm happy to say it was a retired uh, container vehicle that was sitting on a truck property. But again, it was a moment where we were able to raise awareness um, for that business owner who had not thought that he was at risk. 
but now he understands. For your survey and control, flexibility is critical. Um, you have to be open to new approaches and multiple approaches. It's not a one size fits all, even for treatment. Um, different things work at different times within the setting that you are working in. You must be willing uh, to take all of those things into account. And right time, right place. Uh, you can keep going back to the same location, but you need to alter the schedule that you do it. Like I said, the time of the day, the season uh, may make a difference. Uh, we had a location uh, that we were surveying, had been there for a couple of years. And, you know, looking at the risk models, looking at everything, we thought there really should be something here. And lo and behold, um, on one of the visits, somebody moved, you know, a um, hundred yards in another direction, and then they found the population sitting there. So um, don't even think that there's a box, you know, so there's no box to think outside of. There is no box. You just got to be creative, um, be flexible. And again, partnerships with industries you've never thought of. Um, and that's really hard to do. Um, with all the things that we have to think about in our regular jobs, but start working on those partnerships now with your universities, uh, with your state agencies, um, with different industries. Uh, you will need their assistance um, to prevent this and to main, uh, contain it if you do find it. And that is all for mine at this moment. So Chris, any last? Any other things we need to, to share with folks? I think that we're probably in a pretty good place. I know there are a couple of uh, questions in the chat for, for me, which I'm uh, looking at right now, and I'll try to get the information to folks uh, to answer those. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I did just want to say that the effort out of Pennsylvania, both uh, on the federal and the state side, as well as on the research side, has been been fabulous. And I and I have to say, I think a lot of the credit for the delay in in finding this in New York state is is, you know, uh, Pennsylvania's efforts to to take this very, very seriously and to work really, really hard on this. Um, and uh, I think it's been a great example of, of, of teamwork. We've worked together and, um, you know, our staff have been working together as well, uh, both on the state and the federal side. So a lot of good communication. And I think that continues to be really, really important as we, as we go through this uh, journey, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, journey's a good word for it, Chris, absolutely. So, you know, you mentioned a checklist. Uh, yes. If you could put the link either in the chat or the Q&A to that, people would love to access that. Nancy, that's the Penn State uh, SLF um, webpage. Okay. So, yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And I think that was on the, the handouts for the, on the agenda. Um, I see that there is um, somebody asking about the cost associated with canine training. Um, we are very lucky in that we put in a Plant Protection Act 77721, and I maybe added an extra seven there, um, and have received grant funding from USDA uh, for Lucky. Uh, so she, she has been with us for a couple of years. Um, and. I, I do want to say her handler is Shane Phillips. Uh, Lucky gets all the kudos, um, but Shane is the one that is leading her and, and working with her. So it's a team there. So I've got the question and answer open also. And so there's a question in there about whether there have been, whether there have been any interceptions of SLF in migratory beekeeping operations. And I don't think I've had that experience in New York that I can remember. And I don't know, Dana, have you had any interactions there? Um, I am not aware of any. I know that our apiary inspectors uh, for any um, bees that are moving out of a quarantine area 
they actually inspect the beehives. They work with their beekeepers and we actually inspect them and issue a FIDO for that uh, prior to their, them moving out of the area and the apiary, the beekeepers are required to have a permit. So, and then there's another question here, I think, I guess it's for me from Joe Collins about whether we were finding them, when we were finding them at recreation spots, were they predominantly found on, on Tree of Heaven? And yeah, that was kind of where we would initially find them. And I think, you know, one of the other things that's really important um, is that as you, as your inspectors or surveyors get more experience, they are going to get much better at finding this. In particular, they are going to get much better at finding egg masses. And so that particular location in the Hudson Valley, we started seeing it on, on Tree of Heaven. Um, but then as you looked at it more carefully, you were finding it on, uh, on wild grapes and poison ivy, you were finding eggs on the, you know, posts on the uh, walkway, because there's, a, I guess, a wet spot in that particular location, and so there's a little bit of a uh, causeway on the trail there, I guess, and so as you get more experienced, you're going to be much better at finding it. And I, I would say really important if you have the opportunity to connect with another state and get some of your people familiar with it. Um, you know, in New York, you know, we found it on Staten Island and then we very quickly uh, had a succession of finding it in other places. And I think that was because people were getting a little bit more familiar with it and um, the survey became more effective. And I would agree with you on that, Chris, because the egg masses can be very um, deceiving um, until you know, until your eye is kind of trained on what to look for, you, you may ignore it. Uh, we get a lot of people who think it looks like lichen. It looks like a dried mud splot uh, mm -hmm. towards the end of the season. Uh, but Pennsylvania has had, and we're, we're very happy California has come out and stayed with us for a bit. North Carolina's made a couple of trips. I know, like you said, New York and Pennsylvania have exchanged uh, work teams there. Just that hands-on experience is, is very important. Um, yeah, and and you know, I know there's there's the there's the the uh, gymnastics that we have to do to do to travel to another state sometimes, but it is it is worth uh, getting some of your key people out there um, and use that train the trainer model on survey. I think it's been really really important. Yes. So, Scott, I think we might be. Um, we're taking lunch time now so yeah, you know what i'm not going to interrupt you too i was going to 